Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Once again, welcome to our Thursday CME. The topic for today is approach to language delay, a clinical over overview. And the chairperson for today's CME is Dr. Vineet Bhusan Gupta. Last week, sir, last week also sir was the chairperson. Sir is MRCP, MRCPCH, and DCH. And have introduced London. last time, so yes, sir. I, the, the, no they are new. Repeat that. Okay. <laughs> Okay, sir. Let's start. So presently, sir, is uh, Dr. Vineet, consultant. Presently, sir, is senior consultant, pediatric neurologist at Indrapas Apollo Hospital. Uh, over to sir, Dr. Vineet Bhusan Gupta. Yes, sir. Start. Right. Now. So Today's speaker is Dr. Priya Jain. She is alumni of uh, um, Molana Ajad Medical College. And after doing her MBBS, she uh, chose to do her PG from Lady Harding uh, Medical College. And after that, she, at the same time, at the same year, she did her DNB. And then she went into the practice. And after a long gap, what um, she decided to change her branch, not change, I would say she, she decided to upgrade or in other terms, but not as changed as her husband has done so. I'm sorry, Priya, <laughs> I'm taking the liberty to, <laughs> to no highlight a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm really, really impressed by that. The people here who most of you might not be aware that Dr. Priya had changed only from pediatrician to a developmental pediatrician. But her husband uh, was an accomplished uh, Malanian MS ENT, practicing ENT surgeon, successful. And then he chose to pursue her childhood dream, his childhood dream. And now he is a captain with the airline, which he's flying for last quite a number of years, 10, 15 years. So yes. Dr. Priya has done a little bit twist, but her husband <laughs> as against her husband. So yeah. I'm sure that Dr. Priya will highlight um, enlighten us on the language delay, which is and nowadays, I mean, at least I can say that in my practice in this COVID year, I'm the, the, I've seen four times more than what I used to see in practice. So in, in one OPD, sometimes I see four or five patients who are heading towards that. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure the COVID has done a lot of harm to these youngsters. So over to Dr. Priya. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vineet, for supporting me in my journey into this new field of developmental pediatrics. And uh, thank you, Dr. Sandhya and Dr. Vimal for giving me this opportunity to speak on this platform. Uh, so coming to my uh, presentation. Why isn't it going again? So coming to my presentation, uh, so why are we 
you know, sitting at 9 p.m. on a working day and discussing about language delay. As Dr. Vineet already has stated that we are seeing a lot more of language delay in children, especially because of the COVID lockdowns and lack of stimulation of these children. So the prevalence of language delay in children between the age of three to seven years is as high as two to 19%. The higher uh, percentage shown here in this picture is uh, mainly if we take a lesser age group. So if we are taking kids between zero to three years, a lot of Indian studies have been done on that age group and they give a higher prevalence rate of between 16 to 20%. Whereas uh, when we take kids from three to seven years, the prevalence tends to decrease. The Indian studies show a prevalence of 16 to 20%. The male preponderance is markedly there, a male to female ratio of three is to one. Uh, most of the language delayed children have associated com comorbidities in the form of intellectual disability and autism. Almost 50% of language delayed children have comorbidities. Now, there is a dilemma between in the pediatricians mainly on how, how to approach. So whether we should have a wait and watch policy or whether we should start investigating and intervening. So here, uh, there is a, a subset of uh, children with language delay who are called the late talkers or children who have late language emergence. These children are mainly in the age group of 18 to 36 months. And in these children, there is seen that there is spontaneous resolution of any language delay by three years in up to 60% of these children. And 70% of them have absolutely no language problems by the time they are four to five years of age or when they are basically entering school. Now, if we look at the right side of this uh, slide, we see why we need to talk about language delay. There are two main problems which happen with language delay. One is that it has a later presentation. So motor delays are picked up faster by the parents and are, you know, it is a concern for the parents always that the child is not sitting or the child is not standing. But language delay is something which the parents tend to not, uh, are not aware of it. Parental awareness is very poor as far as this is concerned. Also, it is a very low visibility problem and parents, 70% of parents do not even know that you know, they are supposed to be communicating with their children for the language to develop. Now, here are two pictures, which basically are the two most famous quotes uh, which are used world over. The first is that, the first depicts, uh, uh, you know, actions speak louder than words. And the second is basically that love needs no language. So why do we need language then? Is language really necessary? Now look at these two pictures. Now this child is showing an empty cup and it could mean, look, I have finished. Look, give me some more. Can I have milk? Can I have tea? I'm having a tea party. It could mean any of these things. Now, the girl is saying a single word, which is car. Now, the car could mean I have lost my toy car. Look, there's a car which has come outside and parked. I want to go for a ride in the car. So, it could mean anything. So, coming to communication, what is communication? It is defined as an exchange of ideas, information, thoughts, and feelings between the sender and the receiver. Now, there is only two things which are required in communication. There is a sender and a receiver, and there should be an intent to communicate. And communication is something which is prevalent across all species. It is not unique to humans. Communication is very important for a child's personal development, for his social interactions, and later on for his learning abilities. So how do we communicate? Communication can be through gestures, through the body posture, through facial expressions, through eye contact, through head and body movements, and through vocalizations. As we know, whales and dolphins, they have a very good communication system in which you know, they can send signals across long, long distance in sea. Also, we know that most of the animals have you know, different calls for uh, distress, for communicating danger, uh, for mating. So, then what is language? Communication has two major components. One is the speech and one is language. 
So language is basically the uh, language without speech is what is the written language or the sign language. An overlap of language and speech is the spoken language and speech without language is basically only vocal sounds like parroting. So coming to language, language is a set of symbols or basically a rule-based system in which has been created to communicate more effectively and it is understood only by that particular group of individuals who have made that language. So, but creating language is, is based, has, you know, the historians basically say that language is one tool which was, which has been developed by humans or homo sapiens. And this has revolutionized us as to be the most powerful beings on this planet. So, you know, like we don't have the bulk of an elephant, we don't have the speed of a tiger, but despite that, we are able just because of a strong social network and because of our strong language communication skills, we are able to be all powerful. So coming to the components of language, language has two main components, and this is the most important because most of the parents and I may say even us, we tend to uh, uh, deal with the expressive part of language, which are, uh, which is the spoken language. But a very big component of language is the receptive uh, part of language, which means basically that we have understood what is being said to us. So, and both these components of language also include the facial expressions, the body language and the context. So it is not just speech, it also includes the whole context of speaking. Coming to the domains of language. So we have, there are basically five domains of language. The phonology is the basic start, which is the phonemes or the speech sounds. So in, if we come to the English language, then we have all the vowels and the consonants which form the phonemes. And in Hindi, it is all our swar and venjan. So these are the smallest sounds, which, which are speech sounds, because we have other sounds like the horn, the whistle, but these are not phonies. Coming to morphology, morphology is the study of morphemes. Morpheme basically means nothing but words which have a meaning. So you know, all the words which have meaning form morphology. So bat, has sense, but if I say ABT, uh, it is making no sense. So coming to syntax, syntax is the grammar of the language. So the grammar of the language uh, in, is the smallest would be a noun, a verb, and a noun. So Mira eats a banana. So that the grammar uh, of is uh, what is basically the syntax of language. Now these three constitute the form of language. Then we come to the content. So the content or the semantics is the meaning behind the words or the meaning behind the sentences. So in if I say that, uh, you know, uh, I like uh, dancing, but if I say the desks are dancing, it is not making any sense. So even if the grammar is correct, but the meaning is, not there. Uh, pragmatics is the use of language or basically the social context of language. So in pragmatics, we basically come to what is the context of the language uh, of speaking? What is the environment of speaking? What is uh, the relevance of my speech? What is the way of delivering? And also turn taking abilities. So the conversation, how to stop, how to start, what to say, when to say, this all comes in the pragmatics or the usage of language. So then what is speech? Speech is just the neuromuscular act of producing sounds that are meaningful. So it is an oral expression of language and it is basically just the motor cortex, which is giving signals to the uh, oral apparatus or the oronasal apparatus and the respiratory system, the larynx, pharynx, controlling the resonating system of our uh, speech production and producing sound. 
So that is the speech component. So components of speech would include articulation, voice, and fluency. Articulation is the muscular coordination of the uh, oronasal apparatus. Voice is the modulation, which is basically the upward passage of air, which is being controlled to give an amplitude or loudness, to give a pitch to the sound, which is the frequency, and to give a quality or timbre of voice when we say that it is a soft voice, it is a musical voice. Fluency is the smooth forward flow of speech. So the speech should be such that it is pleasant to hear. It does not have any disruptions or pauses or breaks, and it is not disturbing to either the listener or the speaker. So both should be uh, okay with, with hearing the speech and speaking. Now coming to what are the prerequisites for language development? We know that as even in infancy, uh, the hearing is there even before birth. As soon as the child start, uh, is born, the child starts hearing, the child starts uh, responding. So how is language developed so fast uh, in humans? So for, uh, the hearing and the vision and uh, an intact auditory and visual apparatus is required. Also, there needs to be an external stimulation. So therein is the most important prerequisite for language development that the child or the infant needs an external sensory stimulation via hearing and via the visual fields. Both are important to stimulate his auditory cortex and his visual cortex. Intent is always there to communicate. So we are born with an intent to communicate. Attention or the listening aspect can be developed by having more, uh, you know, making more faces with the child, interacting with the child and drawing the child's attention. Then we need the proper brain functioning. So the coding and decoding, the integration and processes, they all happen in the auditory cortex, the visual cortex which are the primary language areas in the brain. Apart from these, we also need a good memory or a memory, uh, sufficient memory for us to recall what we have learned and a cognitive ability. So if the cognitive ability and memory is poor, then language development will not take place at the same pace as for the other kids. And lastly, we come to the uh, speech production apparatus, which is the vocalization and articulation, in which we need a, a, a in, intact muscular strength for the diaphragm, larynx, and oral muscles, and also a neuromotor control of these this apparatus. So coming to the wernicke jespin model, which is the basic model for language pathways in the brain, it has seven primary areas. So the primary auditory cortex, the primary visual cortex, the primary visual cortex sends messages to the Wernicke's area via the angular gyrus, the Wernicke's area, which is the main receptive area of the brain, which basically will decode what has been, what is being said. So it is the decoding area of the brain. There, from there, via the arcuate fasciculus, messages are sent to the Broca's area. Broca's area is the main expressive area of the brain, which is basically uh, interpreting what has been said and making motor responses. Now the Broca's area will send signal to the primary motor cortex and the motor cortex will then work our muscles to produce sound. So the basic seven areas <clears throat> which coordinate language are these. But there are many secondary areas which are involved in language pathways. So we are very fortunate that we are now able to, all the initial studies uh, were basically done with children or with adults who had either brain injuries or strokes with damage to a particular area of the brain or in split brain uh, syndromes or where there was some brain malformations. And thus the study of the speech patterns or the language patterns were dis uh, deciphered. But now we have functional MRI studies, we have transcranial magnetic resonance uh, studies, and these studies are now showing, are able, able to uh, tell us exactly which areas of the brain 
sort of light up or sort of get activated when we are speaking or when we are receiving uh, or understanding language. So the secondary areas which we call are basically the motor and sensory association areas and also the general interpretation area. So the general comprehension, the memory area, all of them are activated. And it is said that when you are listening, actively listening, almost half of your brain gets lit up while speaking is more, you know, it, it activates a very smaller area of your brain. So right now, hopefully your brains would be much more active than mine. Now, uh, coming to brain lateralization. So brain lateralization is something which is very uh, important as far as language is concerned, because language is one of the main uh, higher mental functions or cognitive functions of the brain, which have a strong lateralization. Uh, it is said that in left-handed, in right-handed individuals, almost 95% have a left dominance, whereas even 70% percent of left-handed individuals have a left dominance. So a left predominance is very uh, commonly seen as far as language is concerned. Uh, we know that vision and hearing are contralateral. So they, you know, the left side of the brain receives signals from the right eye. And similarly for hearing that the left ear will send signals to the right side of the brain. Now, left lateralization is there very predominantly with speech, reading, writing, and verbal memory. Whereas right, does right play any role? Of course, right plays a role. Right plays a role, whereas it is gestures, body language, expressions and emotions, the abstract ideas and spatial memory. So these are also a very big component, especially of the receptive uh, language, even in expressive language, the way we speak, our gestures, our emotions, which are coming on our face, they all have a right-sided uh, uh, activation. There is a bilateral activation or bilateral representation in the brain for general comprehension, for semantic and syntactical processing. So as far as word production, word meaning, and grammar is concerned, we have bilateral representation. Whereas components of speech, which are phonemic discrimination, where that means discriminating the speech sounds, a sentence comprehension, understanding the meaning of a sentence, and verbal fluency, these are predominantly left side. So an understanding about lateralization is basically important to know that if we are dealing with a particular type of language deficit, which part of the brain might be injured or malformed? Coming to language acquisition. So acquiring language is basically a stepwise process and the rates of development, as we know with all other fields of development uh, can vary among children to a great extent, but the sequence is essentially the same. So there are few theories of language acquisition. The most common ones are the ones which were put forward by Chomsky, which who says that we have a language acquisition device in our brains, which gets activated. And we this is the nativist theory that we have an innate ability to develop language. And the only thing is a trigger which is required from by uh, the external stimulus by other, our parents when they start speaking to us. And then we automatically learn language. Skinner came up with the theory of behaviorism in which he basically states that it is mainly by reinforcement and imitation that we learn language. Whereas the interactionist theory or the interactionism theory is the one which is most commonly uh, favored now, in which they say that social use of language, need for social communication, and understanding the meaning of words, that is the one, that is basically what is causes us to have language. So if a child says a word, he's not just verbatim repeating what he has learned from his parents, but he is saying it with a meaning. He, if he is saying milk, that means he's understood that I, if I want milk, I need to say this word milk. So there is a meaning behind it before the child starts speaking. 
So coming to the stages of language acquisition, it is divided into a pre-linguistic stage, which is from the zero to 12 months. In this stage, we have mainly wing and babbling, uh, which is there. Then we have the holophrastic stage, which is between 12 months to 18 months. I'm not going through a lot of detail because as pediatricians, uh, language milestones is something which uh, we are very well aware of. So in 12 to 18 months of the holophrastic stage, this is basically the single word stage. So we have single words like mama, papa, de, de, aja, which have meaning. Next comes the two word stage, which is an 80, between 18 to 24 months in which the child starts joining two words, mama, car, de, do, so things like that. Telegram stage is, which is comes by between two to three years of age. A telegram stage is when the child starts forming sentences, but they might not be grammatically correct. And they have basically, uh, they are basically just saying what the child wants or needs to do. So uh, like in a telegram, you just say the main words, mama, go, ka. So they, convey, they might not convey a proper meaning, but it is a sentence. Then comes the near adult grammar stage, which is between three years to five years. Here, the child is mostly speaking in a grammatically correct sentence. And lastly is the full competence stage, which is beyond five years where the child not only is saying grammatically correct uh, sentences, but the sentences have more depth, the sentences have more expression, they have more uh, details, you can say. Coming to communication disorders. So we know that as far as communication is concerned, there might be a problem with speaking, reading, writing, social interactions, converse, conversation, or understanding language. But what are the other areas which can also cause communication disorders? Cognition, in which you have attention, memory, organization of the thoughts, reasoning abilities, the judgment, and the executive functions. It is an equally important part in, in having a communication or a language delay. You also can have an emotional or behavioral problem which can cause communication delay. If there is initiation, inhibition in starting a conversation, stopping, you have anger control or anxiety or confidence uh, problems. And then we have the physical uh, aspect which is a muscle control for the speech, uh, fluency of voice which if it is disfluent then it, is, it can cause stuttering and the basically the muscles of uh, speech production. So this is an overview of the communication disorders. So we have two main categories, the developmental disorders and the acquired disorders. In the developmental disorders, developmental disorders basically mean that they are present since childhood, whereas acquired disorders can happen anytime. So in the acquired disorders, the most common is the current ear infections, which can cause a language problem. The others are trauma, stroke, brain injury, vocal cord paralysis, neurodegenerative and neuromuscular disorders. And two main uh, psychological or psychogenic uh, disorders which are of interest to us as pediatricians are puberphonia and selective memory. So these are, uh, puberphonia is seen in adolescent males and where they tend to have the squeaky voice which has breaks and it is mostly due to poor development of the laryngeal enlargement. Whereas selective mutism can as basically a conversion or a functional disorder and where the child just stops speaking maybe in, uh, in social uh, conditions, but at home. And uh, we had this one child who uh, was labeled as autism, but when we uh, the parents showed us the videos, it was unbelievable that this child is the same child who has come to our OPD because the child was playing, the child was talking, the child was running around. And it was actually impossible to, you know, correlate these two children that they are one and the same. Because in the OPD, the child was not responding, was not looking, there was no eye contact. And it was so we ultimately with by ruling out the other conditions, we then uh, went in for behavioral management and uh, labeled as selective mode. Coming to the developmental uh, 
disorders. There are primary disorders. Primary disorders means that we do not basically have an etiological diagnosis to it. Secondary disorders, there is something which is causing the language delay. Again, here congenital deafness is at the top. Intellectual disability, autism, cerebral palsy. So these four basically comprise maximum of the secondary communication disorders. These four uh, conditions associated. Cleft lip and palate is also very common. Brain malformations and chromosomal disorders. In the primary, we have language and speech disorder. So coming to the primary language disorders, we have the language disorders and the speech disorders. Speech disorders are mainly the speech sound disorders, which could be articulation disorders, childhood apraxia of speech, or also called as dyspraxia, and childhood dysarthria. So a little about uh, CS. So childhood apraxia of speech is basically where there is no muscle weakness. So the difference, uh, how, how to distinguish between uh, apraxia and dysarthria is that in dysarthria, there will be facial muscle weakness. And it is basically because of muscular weakness uh, that or uh, the nerves which are innervating the muscles uh, are, have a problem. Uh, and this is mainly seen in uh, cerebral palsy. So these children uh, are not able to speak because of this problem. And we usually will see a, uh, when we uh, go ahead with uh, the examination, we, have, we see that they have facial muscle weakness. Whereas uh, childhood apraxia of speech is uh, there will be no muscle weakness. The child knows what to say. The, if you ask the child to write, the child can write very well. The words are there, but there is a problem with coordinating the movements of the um, facial muscles to speak out those. We have a different, a, a different subset of the voice disorders, which are dysphonias. These are basically mostly because of vocal abuse to the vocal cords. So here we have uh, polyps, we have, uh, um, you know, uh, pe people with uh, where they need to use their voice very often with higher frequencies, the singers and the teachers, which usually have these voice disorders. Puberphonia also comes in this category. And we have the fluency disorders, which is disfluency or stuttering, where we have uh, breaks and pauses and uh, the child is unable to have a smooth forward flow of speech. Coming to the language disorders, these we will discuss in a little bit more detail. So we talked about, uh, we talked about uh, something called the late talkers or children who had uh, late language emergence in which we found that almost 60% of the children uh, you know, caught up with their peers by the time they were three years of age. So do we need to investigate everyone? Because since we are dealing with a huge chunk of children who will get better on their own, who do not need anything at all, except for maybe stimulation, what, who are the kids whom we need to look out for? So in this category, we have, we have a few risk factors which have been seen, which are associated with language delays developing into disorders. Here, male gender, three times more prone to have a language disorder. A family history of uh, language disorders or a family history of congenital deafness, there is almost a 20 times higher risk. It is also seen in consanguineous uh, twin, um, monozygotic twins that they also tend to have, uh, both the twins tend to have language delays. Prematurity and birth asphyxia. So uh, his birth history is very important. A poor parental education, lack of environmental stimulation, and poor socioeconomic status. They have evidence-based studies which show that all these factors do have a very high uh, risk of children developing language disorders. Developmental delays in other areas. So if there is an isolated language delay or a speech delay, the chances of developing into a disorder are less. Whereas if the child has a global delay, then the chances that there is a language disorder is more. And delay in both expressive and receptive components. So whenever we are uh, looking at a child, if we see that the child is not speaking very well, but the child is communicating very well via gestures, via with a non-verbal communication by pointing, the chances are that they 
the development of language disorder would be less in these children. So the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual or the DSM-5, it defines developmental language disorders. So the developmental language disorders were previously called as specific language impairment. So now the DSM-5 has come up with, uh, the, um, they have classified this as developmental language disorders. And they are basically classified as an individual who has a hard time to use language in any format, whether it is speaking, writing, understanding, sign language, semantic, syntactical, or pragmatic errors. So any of these is uh, the usage of language if it is a problem consistently. If the language capacity is significantly below what is expected for age, so mostly we take, uh, for as for all other developmental delays, we take uh, less than two standard deviation as what is significant delay. And it should hinder social participation and it tends to hinder academic achievements. So if these are there, plus the delay should be present from early childhood, only then it can be called as a developmental delay and uh, sorry, developmental disorder. And it should not be a result of sensory impairment, motor dysfunction, intellectual disability, or any other medical condition. If these criteria are met, then it is labeled as a developmental language disorder. Now, what are the subtypes of this? We have, like we were saying that there are two components, an expressive component and a receptive component. So expressive language disorders are the ones in which expressive language is the one which is a problem. In these children, mainly we will find that they have a problem with finding words. They will form very short sentences, very simple sentences, basic sentences. There will be substitutions for the words. They are not able to get a word. So they will you know, just substitute it with the maybe the meaning, maybe some other word. They will use a lot of space holders. Uh, like so so they will they will keep wanting because they're not able to find the word they will just use placeholders and non-specific words receptive language delay on its own isolated is very rare so um, but if we see uh, autism children so children who are in the autism spectrum they have very poor receptive uh, receptive skills, though their expressive skills may be exaggerated even. And the kids with receptive uh, language disorders will have, will be highly expressive, they will be just talking, but the content is not there, the expressions are not there, and the vocabulary is not there. So just keep on saying something. It might not make any sense. This is the most common, the mixed receptive and expressive type. In these, we have two sort of two types of deficits: the phonological syntactic deficit and the lexical syntactic deficit. Phonological syntactic deficit basically is the word sentence structure, whereas the lexical syntactic deficit uh, includes the meaning and the usage of language. Now we come to a subset called the social communication disorders, which was previously called the semantic pragmatic disorder. This is very commonly seen in children who are in the autism spectrum. Here we can have, we might have a very, as I was telling, a very high level of verbosity. The child is speaking on a topic and is going on speaking whether the listener is interested or not. The use of a very grown up or adult type of language, there would, could be echolalia or just repetition without understanding the meaning. And, but they would also have poor turn taking, so they do not know when to stop, when to start, they will interrupt conversations. The uh, child will have, uh, might go on speaking at length on a topic which is not relevant and might seem more friendly. Or if, you, if the child keeps interrupting the conversation or the child does not answer your questions, it might be, the behavior might be considered as rude. But this, this, um, uh, social communication disorder is something which is also seen uh, like autism is very uh, highly prevalent. You know, there's a great male preponderance, but social communication disorder is something which uh, we are seeing in uh, females as well. 
So if the an autism uh, child with autism, uh, you know, does not fall in the autism spectrum range and does not have repetitive, repetitive uh, restricted behaviors or any hyper or hypersensitivities, but the child uh, has social communication problems, then the child comes into the category of a social communication disorder rather than autism. These two are rarer language disorders, a central auditory processing disorder and auditory verbal agnosia. Central auditory processing disorder is basically your hearing apparatus is normal, but you are not able to make sense of what you, you are hearing. So it, it, rely, it is a, mainly a problem in the um, uh, auditory association. So you have poor auditory discrimination, auditory memory, you cannot recall, auditory sequencing. If I say a word like I say elephant, the uh, person with CAPD might hear it as effilent. So the sequencing is not right. The discrimination, they are not able to make, discriminate between the speech sounds. And the memory recall for auditory, if I say something, they are not able to immediately uh, uh, speak it back. So these are the problems which happen with CAPD. Auditory verbal agnosia is what is called as pure word deafness. Here, the problem is the sound is heard. Non-speech sounds are very well comprehended. So a horn, a whistle, a bell ringing, a phone ringing, these are things which the children can understand. But speech sounds cannot be understood. So when uh, a child with auditory verbal agnosia is hearing someone speak, they will feel as if the uh, person is speaking a foreign language. They are not able to uh, understand speech sounds. So as I was telling you, there are four main uh, conditions which are associated with language disorders in children. Uh, they include intellectual disability, autism spectrum, hearing impairment, and cerebral palsy. So this is basically an overview of, uh, uh, you know, what is deficient. Uh, if we see the slide, so intellectual disability, uh, the expressive receptive language would be both low, but it would be according to the uh, developmental quotient of the child. Self-help skills are very much low and an audiological assessment is normal. Within autism spectrum, we see that the receptive language or the receptive component of language is very poor. Their ability to understand commands, their ability to follow through is not there. Their social communication is very poor. Whereas expressive language, IQ and self-help skills could be more or less. So we do see a lot of uh, children with autism spectrum who are highly independent, who do not want any help and are before age, they are able to do everything on their own. So their self-help skills could be more than normal also. For the hearing impairment, obviously an audiological assessment would be abnormal and both components of language would be equally affected. In cerebral palsy, again, because there is a problem with production of speech, uh, the neuromotor coordination is not there. So expressive language is much more delayed. Receptive language could be normal and IQ could be normal if the higher mental or cognitive functions have not been affected. And audiology, audiological assessment and social communication are normal. So how do we approach then a child with language delay? So any child with a suspected language delay, there are two main assessments which need to be done. And hearing assessment is a mandatory and a developmental assessment. A developmental assessment will uh, see the, uh, you know, check the developmental milestones in all the four major areas of development, which is the gross motor, fine motor adaptive, personal, social, communication, obviously, and cognition. So these are all the areas which will be uh, checked up in a developmental assessment. Once we do these two assessments, we will have broadly two categories of children, one who have only isolated language delay and the other who have a global delay. A global delay is where there are two or more uh, uh, delays in uh, uh, delays in two or more um, developmental areas. So for all children, we will screen for autism because autism is definitely one which is could be there with an, as an isolated language delay, could present as an isolated language delay. But autism also has a very strong comorbidity with global developmental delay. 
a screen for autism is a must for all children who have a suspected language delay. A positive screen, if it comes, we go for it for the assessment and we intervene for the ASD. If we have a child with global developmental delay and the screen for autism comes as negative, we will then look for the etiological diagnosis because it is a delay in more than one area, then a possible brain etiology could be there, a central etiology could be there. And therefore, if required, we go ahead with an MRI, EEG or chromosomal studies and we intervene accordingly. If this uh, if the child has a developmental, uh, has an isolated language delay and the screen for autism comes as negative, then we are basically left with two main areas to be investigated, whether it is a speech production problem, articulation or voice or fluency, or whether it is a language problem. Again, in the language problem, whether it is a mixed type of a language problem or a social communication problem. So coming to the history, uh, as we had discussed er earlier that prematurity and birth asphyxia are known high risk factors for language delay. So a birth history is very important. We look for prematurity, we ask for prematurity, birth asphyxia, birth weight, ventilation, congenital infections, critical hyperbilirubinemia, septicemia, maternal substance abuse or exposure to teratogen. So most of the other factors cause a uh, increased hearing impairment, uh, critical hyperbilirubinemia, congenital infection, septicemia, and ventilation are known to be very high risk, um, you know, high, uh, associated for, um, with uh, um, a hearing impairment in preterm infants. So these, uh, these are, this history is, need, uh, is to be taken from all the children. A developmental history, a detailed developmental history is very, very important. Now in the developmental history, apart from the all the areas of development, which we will be covering, we need to focus on whether the child had any feeding difficulties during infancy, whether there was any drooling of saliva. We need to see whether the child had a hear, intact hearing apparatus and the level of comprehension. We, if we have already done a hearing assessment, it is very good. But in the history, we need to ask about whether the child had the parents feel that the child can hear properly, whether the child was turning towards the, uh, turn to a sound, listening to the clap of the sound. Then we, a big, big, very big component which we need to take in developmental history is of nonverbal communication. Nonverbal communication is there in between, you know, 12 months to 18 months of age is the, the maximum. So a history needs to be elicited whether the child, even if the child was not speaking, whether the child was communicating in any way, how did the child ask for stuff? What did he do when he wanted or when she wanted something? Uh, so need-based communication. How did, was there pointing? Was there gesturing? Was there just dragging the patient, parent along uh, till the, uh, to sh uh, for the needs-based task? Spoken language, definitely when did the child start Wing, babbling, jargoning, first words, whether the child says any two words, do they have any meaning? And uh, the three other things which we need to look at in the history are play. So play is a very important aspect uh, of a child. So all the children play. And therefore, by understanding the type of play which the child has, we can co we come to know a great deal about their uh, social uh, interactions. So symbolic or pretend play is something which is there between two to three years of age in most of the children. And uh, so they might be uh, pretending to be uh, maybe superheroes. The girls might pretend to you know, bathe their uh, dolls or feed their dolls. So whether the child is engaging in any of these kinds of play or whether the child is just playing solitarily. Social communication, social communication with the parents, how is the child communicating with the siblings? Is there any communication, social communication with his uh, peers or children? Here in is where we are having, facing a big problem these days because there is absolutely no communication with peers. If there's a, it's a firstborn, there are no siblings. There are only, uh, you know, the parents who are there at home. 
and uh, battery. And uh, so this is this field. This is an area which you know in the history for all the parents these days is that there has been no social interaction of the child. The child we have been at home. The child has been uh, you know not uh, communicating to with anybody. Also, a big uh, chunk of these kids, almost forty to fifty percent of children tend to have behavioral problems. Now the behavioral problems, the most common behavioral problem which is seen is that of social isolation. The children are, tend, are withdrawn. There are also anxiety and depression. There is also aggression in these children because they are not able to communicate effectively. There is aggression. So the, because of all these uh, problems which can be associated with language delays, we need to look into the behavioral problems. Sorry, my battery is running a little low. I just connected to this. Very sorry for the interruption. Now the remaining two aspects are our medical history and our family history. So medical history, we need to know about recurrent ear infections. Again, a major factor for language delay any history of meningitis or encephalitis in the in childhood or any brain injury a family history of permanent childhood sensory or hearing loss or any neuro behavioral or neurodevelopmental disorders in siblings or family members as we have seen that there is a almost a 20% higher risk of developing language disorders if there is always a language already a language disorder in the family so in the history again what are the red flags which we are looking for or what are we looking at at different ages when we can safely or say that yes this child is definitely having a language delay by one ear if there is no babbling there are no gestures there is no response to name call by one and a half years if there are no words at all there is no pointing whether it is proto imperative which basically means that it is a needs based pointing give me this, I want this, or a proto-declarative pointing in which the child is just showing something which has, which has evoked his or her interest. So there is no pointing at all and there is no response to simple commands. Please go get your shoes. Please can you give me a plate? Please can you just switch on the light? If there is absolutely, and even with pointing, if we are pointing and the child is still not responding, it is even more, uh, more of a red flag. By two years, there is no joining of two words, there is no symbolic or pretend play, and the child cannot follow even simple commands. So if we tell the child to do a particular task, the child is not able to do it, is not able to comprehend or understand, and is not able to follow it through. By three years, speech which is not understood even by the parents. The child is not asking any questions and cannot follow any two-step commands. So two-step commands would be go put your toy back in the basket and then get me a picture book to read. So one after the other, if we are giving two commands and the child is not able to go through those two commands, maybe just does one, maybe doesn't do even a single one. By four years, 50% of the speech, less than 50% of the speech is not intelligible. The child is not using three word phrases. There is no use of pronouns. I, me, prepositions, out, in, over, under, then it is a problem. If there is difficulty in finding words, the child is not able to find the proper words. And this is the time when the child realizes that my speech or my language is deficient and the frustration in a child begins. This can also lead to problems with fluency and voice. By five years, speech which is not understood by the teachers the child is not making or forming any simple sentences there is difficulty in answering questions so by three years the child should be asking questions by five years the child should be answering questions there is difficulty in telling stories and now by this stage the frustration in a child and the behavioral problems are fully evident 
coming to the physical examination. So this is what we had to elicit in the history. Now the physical examination goes with the normal growth parameters of weight, height, and head circumference. An ENT examination is a must. Uh, outer and middle ear examination of the uh, outer and external and middle ear examination and examination of the movement of the facial muscles, the palate, tongue, lips. So this is something which has to be done when a child uh, comes to you during the examination for language dealing. A neuromotor examination would include if there are any you would just have a uh, see through whether there are any neurocutaneous markers, where is, there is any motor dyspraxia. Motor dyspraxia is basically motor incoordination and it is very strongly associated with language dyspraxia because the dyspraxia syndromes are clubbed together. Examination of communication skills. So herein lies the art of eliciting response from the child, understanding or trying to understand his level of communication. So when a child comes into the clinic, we start talking to the parents, we make uh, uh, elicit the relevant history, we ask about the parental concerns. During that time, continuously, we are all observing the child. So how is the child behaving? The general behavior of the child can be assessed during that time. Whether the child is clingy, whether the child is just keep, keeps pulling the parents, go out of the room, I don't want to sit here. Whether the child is exploring on his own, going there, going here. Then the second step could be when we have established a rapport with the child, where the child is a little more comfortable in the clinic, then we involve him with or her with certain play activities. So during the play activities, we could, you know, let, let him go through a picture book. We could give her some blocks to play with. We could give them some crayons to scribble with. And with all these, we not only assess whether we can assess their attention, how attentive they are, whether they're completing the task, whether they are responding to our commands, if we tell them, or if the parents tell them, color with a red crayon, or just get me the ball, throw it to me. Whether they are they are able to, uh, you know, follow through with the and also the attention. There a lot of information by involving the child in their activities and is answering our questions or is responding to our questions. We can also assess the expressive language. But expressive language is something which even the parents are very clear on. So they will be very clearly tell you that the child is saying these words, the child is using only 10 to 12 words, or whether the child has started use, forming uh, two word phrases. So once we have taken a history, we have done a full thorough examination of the child. We have assessed uh, where the child is as far as we are is now almost clear that yes, the child has some language problem. So how do we now go ahead? Assessments, as we had all, we have already discussed, a hearing assessment is essential. Uh, BERA is what is recommended for all children less than six to seven years of age and an audiometry for older children. Uh, we have had patients who have had uh, audiometry at three years and four years and also have been recommended hearing aids and are using hearing aids and when we go and get a better done they are absolutely they have an absolutely normal hearing so an audiometry is absolutely not cannot be done for a younger child if a child has already had an OE, like we now have a lot of children who are screened uh, at birth for uh, you know, by an autoacoustic emission test. And if they come as pass, and if we feel that there is, uh, the parents feel that there is no problem with hearing, a BERA is still recommended uh, basically to rule out auditory nerve neuropathies or delayed onset hearing loss. So BERA is recommended in all patients who have a <clears throat> language delay. Then we go for the developmental assessment. So what are the 
an objective screening test is always important though by our clinical examination by our history taking we are we can ascertain that you know this the child is has a deficit in maybe fine motor adaptive have has a deficit in personal social uh, milestones but a screening test has two major advantages one it is objective the second most of them are parent questionnaires so when we are for asking these questions to the parents and when they are responding and they also realize that the child is deficient the child has a problem if a child if i am asking a questionnaire to a 3 year old uh, child and i am taking maybe a uh, you know i am asking them a questionnaire which is less for less a three less than like you, you know a 33 month questionnaire for a 36 month old child and the child is still not able to answer most of the questions in a particular area the parents also become very aware that okay our child does have a problem so it becomes easier to counsel the parents becomes easier to tell the parents that yes look there is some delay happening in your child so for development we usually go for the ages or stages questionnaire we also have a developmental profile dp or a denver development screening test any of these screening tests can be done for development. They are very easy. Um, mostly they take about not more than 10 to 15 minutes and they are all parent questionnaires mainly. Observation of the child is also equally important and adds on to the screening test. <coughs> then we have screening tests for autism, which most of us all know is the modified checklist for autism and toddlers. We also have the Trivandrum Autism Behavioral Check. And for language, we have language assess, uh, evaluation uh, test for, from Trivandrum. And we have the clinical linguistic auditory milestone scale, which is most commonly used for screening for language. A formal assessment after all these for language is the receptive and expressive emergent language scale. The reels is mainly or basically done by the speech language pathologist. A psychological evaluation is also very necessary, especially if you are seeing signs of aggression or if you are seeing signs of any behavioral problems in the language delayed child. Coming to interventions. Oh, this I think is probably the most important slide as far as primary care pediatricians are concerned that the, this is the area which we need to keep on stressing upon with the parents. We need to keep telling them at each stage when they come to us as in a well baby visit clinic, how to communicate with your child, how to improve, how to stimulate them. So if we go through this slide quickly, from zero to six months, we can tell the parents to sing lullabies, make faces, make eye contact, talk in a motherly talk. The motherly talk is not a baby talk as in it is not, you know, a mumbling sort of a talk. It is basically a talk which is more exaggerated, which has more emphasis on certain words and there might be a rhyme to it. It is a little slow. So that is what is motherly talk and that is recommended for children. Playing to music, dancing to music, listening, uh, you know, playing music for the, so that the child hears. These are all uh, things which can be done by parents between the first six months. From six to 12 months, point the objects, name them, call your baby by name all the time, play simple games like peekaboo, find the ball, expose the child to different environments and different sounds. This is true for all, you know, uh, you know stimulating all the areas of development. So 12 to 18 months, we... <clears throat> Encourage, you, encourage the use of words. We keep asking questions. We keep, we encourage the child to point and show us things. We show them picture books. We talk about all daily activities which are happening. So talk, talk, talk to your child. That is what we need to emphasize while you're giving the child a bath, while you're giving the child his feed, while you're just taking the child for a walk in the park or a stroll in the park. Just keep describing and talking all the activities throughout the day. From 18 to 24 months, we encourage joining of words. We complete his two word phrases. 
So if he says, mama car, do you want mama to take you out in the car? So we complete that sentence so that the child knows that, okay, this is a full sentence. And what I'm saying is just a part of it. Describe the objects around you. Ask the child to name body parts. Ask the child to name the common objects around. From two to three years, encourage use of sentences. In, let him or her speak proper full sentences. Do not, so usually what happens is that we tend to understand what the child is saying. It's very simple. A child, even if the child says something with pointing or gesturing, the parents, and especially if there is a sibling, they tend to understand the child very well and they will just do it or they will just respond to it. And the child does not, they need to use language or need to speak out those words. So even if we have understood, we should encourage the, their use of words and sentences by saying, I don't know what you mean. Can you please elaborate? What do you want? If he is pointing at a book, which book are you talking about? What do you want me to do? Let them try and speak it out. Encourage storytelling. Encourage categorization. Apple is a fruit. Mango is also fruit. Banana is also fruit. They're all fruits. So you start categorizing. These are all animals. These are all fruits. These are all vegetables. Color identification can be started at this stage. And at this stage, it is very important not to correct the grammar of the child. Here, we are trying to just increase their vocabulary, increase their use of speech. So trying to correct the grammar, trying to keep correcting the words, trying to keep correcting their pronunciations should be avoided during this stage. From three to four years, we encourage the use of prepositions. We ask them to substitute their name by me, I. We encourage use of clear, simple sentences. We want them to have more of a vocabulary and more detailed description. And now a very, very big line which is there below is no screen time. So <clears throat> AAP recommendations, IAP recommendations, world over recommendations for children from zero to two years, absolutely no screen time. This has to be again and again and again emphasized to the parents because uh, we all know how bad it has gone. It is uh, initially the parents used to say, oh, the child cannot say anything, cannot speak anything, but he can, he's listen, he is able to scroll and he comes to the, you know, he's able to come to that particular song and to listen to that song. So everything is well with the child. He is uh, intelligent enough. He can scroll. He can listen. He's all right. There is, there is absolutely no active communication. It is just passive listening. So no screen time at all for zero to two years. A limited screen time of 30 minutes is recommended between two to five years. And that also recommendation is mostly uh, that it has to be supervised and it has to be uh, child friendly. It has to have, you know, some maybe an animated show which the child should be seeing. <clears throat> Coming to the intervention part of language delay, it is a multidisciplinary approach, but the main point of focus are the parents. So the parents are the key to a child uh, attaining its her or his maximum potential. So we need to counsel the parents. We need to keep involving the parents. Then we are trying to start any interventions or any remediation with children, be it language, be it any other field, be it autism, be it ADHD. If the parents are not on board, if the parents feel that this is something which is, uh, you know, which is going to go on its own, we are nowhere with the child. So parent education is a must, parent involvement is a must. The pediatrician, the ENT specialist and the neurologist form one part of the spectrum the speech language pathologist, the occupational therapist, and if required, a sensory integration therapist, or other, other uh, people who will be involved with taking care of the child with language delay. So there are a few um, therapies or there are a few interventions which are uh, done by speech language pathologists, but these are also something which uh, parents uh, are encouraged to do at home 
these are mainly only for children who have language disorders, who have been diagnosed as having language disorder. Self-talk is when the parent is talking about what the parent is doing. Parallel talk is describing or narrating what the child is doing. So that uh, I am going for a walk is self-talk. And parallel talk is what do you have in your hand? Do you have a car in your hand? So it is narrating what the child is doing. A child directed speech is similar to uh, the mother speech where it is simple words, simple sentences uh, with a lot of emphasis, which uh, the child can understand. Expansions and extensions happen once the child starts speaking a few words. So when the child starts speaking, the expansion or extensions are just as I was saying, we expand the two word phrase into a sentence so that the child goes further ahead in the um, process of um, remediation or language uh, uh, acquisition. So what is the outcome of uh, language disorders? Um, it is, the, we know language is the key to learning. Uh, social communication, academic skills, personal development, everything is associated with development of language. So the developmental language disorders would definitely have outcomes which would not be as great, but a lot of studies which have been done on late talkers, talk, uh, the children who caught up with their peers, uh, you know, by three to four years or five years of age, uh, when they were, uh, the studies were done on them later on in uh, uh, life. Most of the studies have been done uh, when they have started formal schooling uh, at about six years of age. Those uh, kids have been, the late talkers have been uh, followed up, uh, follow-up studies have been done at between six to seven years of age. And they have been seen to have poor grammar, a decreased vocabulary, decreased content of speech, poor school readiness and behavioral problems, mainly ADHD. So it is not that the late talkers are absolutely fine. They will start speaking. They will have a good expressive language. They will understand, but they would, they would be a deficit in the vocabulary and the content of their language. Developmental language disorders in childhood, uh, learning disabilities are very commonly associated, obviously, because if there is poor language development, reading and writing skills are hampered. There is a problem in exp written expression and earlier school dropouts are, have been seen. In adult life, a lower employability, lesser skilled work, psychosocial problems, which are mainly depression and low self-esteem. So these are all the problems or the prognosis or outcomes of children who have language delays or disorders. And to summarize, so delay in speech and language development is the most common developmental problem within the age of three to 16 years. Evaluation involves a proper developmental assessing, assessment, including cognition and higher mental function skills. In all cases of suspected language delay an audiometry and a proper ENT examination is mandatory. Diagnosis can only be made after observed performance of the child and results which are validated by a, a, a validated test for language assessment. Management is multidisciplinary, but parents and caregivers are the key to successful interventions. And the primary care pediatrician is in the unique position to identify and counsel the parents and to initiate interventions early. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Priya, for really went beyond covering. my time. Sorry. Um, I, I know this is a very, very extensive um, topic, which you have tried to cover in one hour. Um, very exhaustive, very thorough, starting from the etiology, little bit of pathology, then the assessments, intervention. I, I know this is a bit heavy for a busy pediatricians. But in my 20, 25 years of practice, what I can make a single line comment on this, that the 
I know the, the, the busy pediatricians, uh, or for that matter, everybody's busy. Um, <laughs> when the child comes for vaccination, this opportunity get missed. We are not utilizing that opportunity. I mean, in my experience, I'm sure some of uh, the colleagues are doing that. But what, what I have noticed is that when I ask the parents that, did you mention this to your doctor when you went last for vaccination? Yeah, I said, but he said, no, no, it's okay. He will, he will start speaking or he will start understanding. Yes. If you have any, spent a couple of minutes extra just to know the, the, the red flags, just to I, uh, understand that, uh, repeat back to the parents this, uh, the red flags, then definitely you will be able to pick up in, the, in that two minutes conversation. And that would have been very useful for the uh, parents and the child so that the intervention, I mean, it could be picked up, a formal assessment can be done, an intervention could be started early. Because that's what I've seen in the last 20, 25 years, a lot of uh, these things. So that would be my sincere advice to all our colleagues. I think that's my comment. Uh, I think, um, any questions here? Uh, at what age can be diagnosed apraxia and can it be remediated? Uh, hi, Hemani. Uh, uh, so, diagnosing apraxia would basically be ruling out. Uh, so are we talking about language apraxia or are we talking about motor and a, de a global apraxia here? So, we can diagnose uh, apraxia by the time the child is about three to four years of age. And uh, if we diagnose childhood apraxia of speech, we are basically uh, ruling out, we are basically seeing that the child has an intact hearing apparatus. We are basically seeing that the child has no problems uh, in understanding or cognition. We are seeing that the child has absolutely no muscular weakness of the facies. So once we have ruled out that there is there are no other signs of cerebral palsy, then we uh, you know, we go ahead with seeing whether the child is understanding the words. So written expression is very good in these children. And they yeah. will be able to write. Yeah. But, uh, highlighting apraxia of speech specifically. Yeah, so that's what I'm talking about. The childhood apraxia of speech. Uh, so uh, that is how we will, uh, you know, come down to the fact that it is mainly, first we will rule out whether it is a language problem. If it is not a language problem, then if it is just speech a problem with speech or the speech sounds then uh, we if we rule out facial muscle weakness we are basically then left with uh, childhood apraxia of speech and here the children will uh, know the words but will not be able to speak speak them out clearly so there will be a very uh, discoherent or incoherent uh, speech pattern uh, remediation i am not aware of I'm sorry, but I am not really aware. I think it would be the same as a uh, language uh, uh, pathologist would. Uh... No, it's, not, it's not easy. It's not easy yeah. to do yes. the remediation here. Because... A lot of hard work, a lot of language pathologist specialists, language yes. pathologists who, and there are a few of them uh, who can deal with this. Because the basic problem is in coordinating the motor mus the muscles. So it is very, very difficult to... Um, yeah. Start eliciting no, response. I agree, Himani. It is as good yeah. prognosis. Um, yeah. Absolutely. The, the the problem here is that most of the, most of the speech therapists they do the routine things. There are very few language pathologists who are mm -hmm. trained to do this thing. And um, one, I mean, I know a couple of them. They need a specialist center. They are terribly busy, and they mm -hmm. do the the child cannot uh, find a time for. I mean, the sufficient time. I and parents do that. And another, another comment here, Priya, is the, 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 uh, the central auditory processing defect. They mm -hmm. are one of the most difficult to diagnose most right. of the time. Uh, and then once they diagnose, because I have seen a couple of patients um, and we uh, refer to our colleague, uh, um, and he has done a thorough assessment. And then we discussed that, that, how to handle it. That is also a bit difficult to treat them. But if the parents are educated and persistent, then that can be handled. But the apraxia is the worst one. Yeah. Like, I, any other A question? lot of time, the diagnosis is only not uh, 
been given to the parents about apraxia but if we start doing early intervention and maybe uh, early on then we can definitely uh, have better success rate as compared to working out in a child who is more than 5 years or 6 years of age right. that's what is in my so the question so there the our colleagues is more more important to pick up that yeah mm. yeah yeah uh, uh, can i can i ask a question please yeah please go uh, yeah, dr uh, dr priya uh, legally speaking uh, till what age we are safe if we have not diagnosed a patient with uh, speech development delay speech <laughs> so uh... <laughs> Because I don't think it's, it's I don't think years, anybody would take two years, us to two years of corona that we have all seen our patients on uh, video consultations oh, yes. and uh, vaccinations. They've been just coming and they just wanted to rush away. Very true, sir. Very true. So, uh, in uh, those so times, legally speaking, we will not be pulled up to any court of law for missing a delay. That is for sure. but uh, yes parental concern usually begins at 3 years but uh, at if by 2 years we are not able to pick up that the child has a receptive or an expressive language then uh, definitely we are at fault fine by 2 uh, years we should definitely be able to understand that the child is you know has a there is definitely there is a language delay uh, the child is not using words as required the child uh, even if there is no use of language there is if there is no uh, understanding of language that that is should be evident by two years definitely so th this is what we been doing in normal times uh, maybe uh, corona is different uh, another uh, question in a joint family don't you think uh, this corona won't be affecting these language delays i've been so, asking this question in this forum every time so the sir, language uh, the uh, uh, the joint families are better in these times uh i don't think so but the reason for that is probably that even in joint families um what we are seeing more often is that when we tell the parents you know like you know why uh, if if they they come up with the fact that we don't have time we are, we also have our uh, we have our online presentations going on or we have our jobs and therefore the kids have been left on their own or they have been given devices no but no, if no. We say, say joint yeah. family means there are yeah, lot but if he's not many what, kids around uh, more yeah. children so what i'm saying is that if we if we are, tell them that you know if like you have grandparents and uh, you know the grandparents can interact with the children uh, more often than not we are getting a response that the grandparents are also on their devices are also on their mobiles and screens sorry, and the sorry, interaction dr, dr. priya sorry you are, you are not getting my question yeah. my question is there are a uh, joint family of four brothers the, where there are so many kids and they have not been affected because they have been mingling together all the times they are together they are playing they are chatting they are uh, doing everything so what is your say about it if there are children along if there are peers if there are siblings definitely uh, language delay is uh, less uh, prevalent yeah, but if there I are think. only grandparents in a joint family no, then I, we are not seeing too much of a difference So, so can I answer this question? Hi, I am Dr. Pooja here. Dr. Yeah, Pramit. please, Dr. Pooja. Yeah, go ahead. So, so I remember you asked the same question last time also. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, I, I, I said that I have been asking this question in this forum. So the thing is, so the thing is that it has been proven that what Trevor even autism also it's a interplay between genetics and environmental factors. so definitely 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 environmental factors do play a role if there is if there are parents who are not talking to the child if there are grandparents who are not talking and you have a family of four brothers with n number of children definitely yeah. that would have an upper hand because my environment is very well taken care of and obviously genetics so will be taken care, will be the main thing but you are tackling very well for the environmental factors so again my answer is the same as my previous response if you have a family of four brothers 
and have children wow wow bravo you definitely have thank a better so hand thank, so thank you so much thank you so much there are very few lucky like you dr praveen there are not many around in this thank <laughs> you <laughs> or, or around anywhere <laughs> i would yeah. say i have this uh, uh, they're not come for developmental practice but i have this uh, patients of mine who are three brothers who are staying together who have grandparents with them and there are three siblings of similar age one from each, one of each brother so somehow they have managed to have siblings also of the same age but uh, the girl among them is totally socially inhibited she just just plays with her own brothers and does not talk to anybody outside the family so i don't think that the that environmental stimulation definitely plays a role but yes if you have a neurodevelopmental problem uh, it is there so she yeah, must yeah. be having some underlying uh, yes issues. yes yeah. so you cannot so generalize difference. you cannot generalize yeah. it for joint no, no. families or no. in, in 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 a green no. in a normal way i mean if they all fit that if they, if you compare the uh, yeah. two families one like dr <laughs> praveen kanduzas and like uh, yes. yours uh, or anybody else <laughs> then it will be a, definitely he is in a better position yes. <laughs> what about virtual I, family i also think so yes advantage is obviously there Dr. So Priya, what about the virtual families? Like you know, nowadays you all are living, uh, you know, working from home, and children calls. are all of yeah, and video call. We we speak to our grandchildren on that also on a helps. video call. Yes, that so also sometimes helps. the mother say no, no more screen time. Now, no, how, so, uh, how would you rate that? So screen time? time, yeah. So when so uh, you know, if we go through the recent guidelines which have been given by the IOP on screen time, they have said that. uh the half an hour of screen time which is allowed or which is recommended or even in for uh, the younger kids uh, they have the, what they have the first thing they have said is video calls with your uh, family members which uh, helps so as a screen time if you want to give the child a screen time uh, video calling with uh, your family members is something which is uh, a good um, uh, usage of screen time uh, we are talking about passive yeah that is different uh, interaction not so an active communication yeah this is a this is a personal uh, you know problem because my children one one is abroad and one is outside so then yes. you know, the screen time no, is no, allowed but, or not yes yeah so it is uh, it is recommended to so have video calls over here the logic is that once you are having a screen time so the you are just watching and there are the pictures which are changing which just go, you get glued to that and you right. don't have to interact whereas Absolutely. in a session when we are talking to on a video chat you are always calling the name okay yes. siddha how are you doing it's, siddha it's a two way communication not calling his name constantly so that is a motivation that the child has been called so that is the difference between a normal screen time and a chat video and that what creates the difference so okay. definitely yeah. the ip recommends are everywhere everybody recommends that you can have a good chat time even though on screen which may be only you are stimulating the auditory as well as the visual sensory uh, concern but once you are only watching the screen with no name calling nothing you are just dumb so yeah. what do you say uh, what do you say ma'am about these uh, online classes for our yes, it is going on question last time also i remember this was the same question you asked that online classes and it it it, it 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 has almost almost become a headache i tell you now yeah uh, yeah but sir as per the iap guidelines again uh, there is a healthy screen time and unhealthy screen time so something mm -hmm. which is more productive like chatting like having an online class or learning something is putting it into an healthy screen time category but again it should not be uh, the only thing the way the child is learning obviously a human touch a direct inter interaction with a human being makes a lot of difference online because multi sensory learning just keh raha hu ki kambal mein baith ke bacche sir jhuka ke padhe hain wo sun rahe hain online classes are sun rahe hain kisi ko kuch nahi pata hai every parent cannot sit with their kids सुबह आठ बजे से क्लासेस शुरू होती हैं और वो अपना आराम से कंबल में बैठे हैं सिर्फ ये कहने के लिए कि जब अटेंडेंस होगी यस मैम आई एम प्रेजेंट दैट्स इट टोटली एग्री ऑनलाइन क्लासेस इज इज बेसिकली यू नो समथिंग व्हिच इज 
a necessity uh, it cannot ever be a, a, a means of uh, solution never a means of learning it cannot be it is just that right now we have no other option and that is why we have to go to online class Tot totally agree with with you dr priya dr priya where, where do i send a child for stammering Whom do I send the child if a child is stammering? Uh, stammering can can be uh, uh, dealt with by a regular speech therapist. We do not need a speech language pathologist for uh, uh, just a stammering or a stuttering uh, problem. Any disfluency problem because that is mainly uh, the words are there, the understanding is there, everything is there. The child is just unable to speak clearly and speak fluently. Again, stuttering or stammering. uh beyond 6 years uh, does not have a very good prognosis so the earlier you send the better over here also dr priya i will just uh, put up a point that mm -hmm. we are seeing a lot of stammering people stammering children who come with stammering but the thing is like i don't send them to directly to a again to a person speech person i would see it myself because i see a lot and a lot of issues which have to be resolved because if they are not resolved which are the causes for stammering then the yeah. child will become normal again after a while maybe another 6 months the child would again start stammering so That's we stammer. have to review the cause ki why the child started stammering because there would be a loss of dear one there could be a loss there would be a very unhappy parents divorce anything you have to talk to the parent to resolve the main issue that why he landed up into stammering and then obviously a speech would work for another 3 months and the stammering would the child would be out also yeah. stammering would be seen in a lot of adhd children also because the thought process and the so speech fast. get a correct uh, correlation so that's why that can also happen i personally feel that i see the child first type the case with the child before referring to just to a speech person for clearance of stammering because yeah. we landed into the mess That's again that's true but it also depends on the age of presentation yeah, so yeah. the yeah. earlier you have it you start with behavioral management also of the child you involve the parents or you do a parenting counseling and mm -hmm. see whether the parents are over ambitious they are over correcting mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. if the child is uh, come to a stage where it is uh, hampering his uh, his uh, you know his uh, self esteem and uh, it is at a later age group then the intervention should start sooner rather than later the behavioral management can go alongside but uh, speech it should be there because these children then later on have many more problems yeah So I have one question for you, uh, Dr. Priya. It was a fantastic presentation, so elaborative. The thing is, thank you. I did not realize that I've gone so beyond time. I'm really sorry. <laughs> no, it was so interesting. That everybody is so hooked up. Don't worry on that aspect. <laughs> so the thing is, I just wanted to tell, uh, ask from you that in one of the slides you have put in that once you try to inspect, look in for the uh, the causes for speech delay, then you presented that. Uh, if it's a global developmental delay, you drew to a different thing, and then the other one was intellectual concerns or plain autism. If you have global developmental delay in that wing, you decided that you will go for autism spectrum screening in spite of knowing that it is a global developmental delay. I hope you can go to that slide because yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I, I am not. I know that slide. Let me. Yeah. 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 So the thing was in. you have diagnosed the child as having global development delay you do go for an autism screening and then you find out oh the child has autism and then you treat the autism i will not agree to that because you already have a title of global developmental delay in global developmental delay if you have screened for autism and the child comes positive for autism you are still going to do the whole of the 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 things which you do for global developmental delay Because yes, we are going to intervene for both because no, no, autism no, no, no. and global development delay can be comorbidities. A global developmental delay child can also be autistic. So we will deal with interventions for global developmental delay as well as for autism. We will not just label either as ASD or as GD. We will be uh, uh, seeing what is the predominant, which is the predominant one, and the other is a comorbidity. So they are coexisting and they both have to be intervened with simultaneously. So, so in the slide, it is very—it's not clear. It's 